Hi friends, welcome to the By Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Hoover, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week this season, I'm talking with a guest about how they're using their unique gifts and talents in their specific context and season of life. My prayer for you is that by listening to these conversations, you'll be encouraged, challenged, and equipped to step out by faith using your particular gifts for God's glory. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Melissa Kruger to the show. Melissa wears many hats. She's a wife to Michael, who is the president of Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte. She's a mom to three. She works as an editor at the Gospel Coalition. She serves as the women's coordinator at her church, Uptown Church in Charlotte. And last but certainly not least, she is the author of several Bible studies and books, the latest of which is Five Things to Pray for Your Kids. Melissa's publisher, The Good Book Company, has been so gracious to sponsor today's episode. Melissa has written Five Things to Pray for Your Kids, where she takes us back to the Bible to show us what God's will for children is, so that we can pray in line with that. She selects 21 key areas of spiritual growth and character development, and for each one, she gives us five short prayer prompts drawn straight from the Bible that we can pray for our kids. For more information about five things to pray for your kids, go to thegoodbook.com. I listed Melissa's many hats that she wears, but at heart, Melissa is a teacher who is passionate about helping other women know God's word. So I invited her on to the show today to talk specifically about teaching. We chat about how she's cultivated her own gift of teaching and how she's helping other women learn to teach. I love how Melissa says we're all teachers in some way because we're all called as Christians to do what Jesus said, to go and teach all that he's commanded us. We also talk, Melissa and I, about the insecurities and discouragement that she's faced as a teacher and what she's learned specifically through those things. Melissa's joy and enthusiasm is pretty contagious. I love her so much, so I know you're going to love this conversation. So here, friends, is my chat with Melissa Kruger. Thank you so much, Melissa, for joining me today on my podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You are one of my favorite people, I think. I don't know if I've ever told you that, that, but every time I'm around you, I just really, I really like you. Oh, I feel the same way. I was laughing, thinking about when we met, which it's always fun to meet when you're on a panel with like four other people and 600 people in the audience, but it's so fun. And I was like, I love everything she's saying. Well... I appreciate that. I've told you about how I felt about that panel. So um, it was at the Gospel <laughs> Coalition a couple of years ago. And uh, were you facilitating the panel, I think? I think I was. You did a great job. You were okay. really helpful. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> we, won't, we won't rehash it. Um, but can you, maybe for those who don't know you, who are listening, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, I am, I'll start with my family um, because I always start with my jobs and I sometimes feel badly. Um, I am married to Mike who works um, for Reformed Theological Seminary here in Charlotte. He is president, but he's a New Testament professor. Um, And then we have three children, Emma, John, and Kate. My oldest just turned 18. (gasps) So I'm it sounds terrible to me. Um, and I can't believe she's going to leave me next year after, after all these years of getting to be her mom. Does she know where she wants to go? She does. She really wants to go to UNC Chapel Hill here in North Carolina. So she'd only be about two and a half hours. So we completely approve that. (laughs) We think that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I work at my church. I've worked at my church for 10 years. I've been on staff doing women's ministry. And then I also have worked for the past couple of years with TGC um, as an editor for them. And now I'm doing more content and books for them. And so I like both jobs and they both feed each other. um, But sometimes it's a lot of balls to be juggling. Uh, Yes. As you know. (laughs) You wear a lot of hats because I'm thinking... Your husband's job probably requires you to be present at certain things Uh, and then your job, your jobs, and then you're a mom. So there's a lot of hats you're wearing. And I would love to know in what ways you think, or I would love to know what you think your sweet spots are. Like what really about those things makes you come alive? That's a great question. I feel like the Lord has been in this process of slowly showing me 
what those spots are that I really love to, to do. And I would say primarily I have always felt called to teach. I was actually a high school math teacher in my other life is what my mom used to say. And now I understand why she says that. Um, so I, I love teaching high school. I love teaching kids. So I realized that really translated well into teaching the Bible. I love doing that. And, and what I've even learned that I love more than being up front teaching is I love teaching through writing. Bible studies for women. So I was so um, cared for and loved on by people like Kay Arthur, who took the time to write studies. So it taught me by doing how to study the Bible. And so I'm so thankful for that. So I love doing that for other women and kind of giving back to them what was given to me. But I've also really found I love doing leadership development. And that I didn't know about. You know, I think that's the one, the door that the Lord keeps opening up. I like sitting around with a group of women and brainstorming about how we can do ministry ideas. How can we move from, hey, mentoring is a really great thing to making a whole system in our church so we can help that flourish. You know, I love getting to the practicals, I guess. So often we talk up here about, yeah, women's ministry is important or this is important. I'm like, but how do we do it? So I really like getting in the nitty gritty and saying, how do we actually live this out in the church? So mm-hmm. that's, those are the two main ones. Is your role at the church full time? No, <laughs> um, it's supposed to be um, fifteen to twenty hours a week, which you know it's ministry, <laughs> right? So I feel like those are those are always um, because the, the tough thing with ministry and the wonderful thing about ministry is so often your job is people, and so when there is a crisis. You can't say, well, that didn't really happen on my scheduled time for work. (laughs) So it definitely ebbs and flows. And I'm trying to do a better job of forcing um, rest into my schedule. And I am not good at that. So that's, Mm -hmm. that's something I'm learning. (laughs) You are probably a strong, do you have strong leadership gifts as well as teaching? I think so. I would, I, I would say I love leading women from below rather than above, if that makes sense. And I even really like my job description is that I am not the captain of the ship running where we're going as women, but more I'm there to help women use the gifts they've been given um, to go out into the church and I'm there to support them. So I, for instance, one thing we do is we have a lot of outreach Bible studies Um, A lot of women don't even know what curriculum to use, where to begin, how do I do childcare? And so I, I'm not the one leading the study. I'm the one talking to them on the phone so that they can learn how to lead the study um, and help them find good resources. So I feel like I'm underneath trying to help women, which I'm really more comfortable with that than kind of directing the ship, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm thinking as you're talking is when I was in my twenties, these were kind of things that I could see myself doing. I had no basis for that really, besides that I had dipped my toe a little bit into ministry because my husband was a pastor, but I'm thinking for somebody who's in their twenties, they're wondering, how did you get these jobs? How did you get on staff at a church doing women's ministry? Because a lot of churches don't hire women to, for, for these kinds of positions. They're, they're volunteer. How did you get to be working with the Gospel Coalition? How did you get to start writing and writing Bible studies? How did you get where you are? (laughs) I like to call myself the accidental writer, the accidental women's ministry person, the accidental editor for sure. I mean, I majored in math in college. (laughs) Nothing I did professionally was leading me down this path. I wouldn't have even thought to go to seminary. And I kind of look back. I feel like women today would make that choice. Um, I didn't know it was really an option that I could have chosen 20 years ago. Um, And so I will say, I'm like you, I was married to a man in ministry. So I was full board. I wanted to do it with him. That was a great thing for me to get to be alongside him. And I'm the wife who was saying, tell me what you're learning. What is this? You know, we're having all these discussions and things, but all of it really happened just by slow, small steps within the context of the local church. And I'm really thankful for that, um, that the first part of my ministry started by um, really working in the local church. And that happened by just being a young stay at home mom who wanted to share the gospel with people. And so four of my friends and I started an outreach Bible study to our preschool 
And we all taught, we all shared those roles, and we all did that for 13 years of just inviting everyone at the preschool to the study. And each year, a few new people would trickle in, and we really saw the gospel go out through that. But my pastor, they decided they wanted to have a woman on staff, and he called and asked if I would apply for it, and I did. And slowly, that led to just more ministry and things like that. But honestly, the writing that is coming out now was done 10 years ago. (laughs) I'm really slow to get published. Um, A lot of it, I was writing for those Bible studies because I couldn't find materials. Yeah. Now we have a lot more materials that are wonderful out for the church. But if you remember back, if you go back 15 years, there weren't many things available. And so that's why I started writing. It was just completely because there was an empty spot. Um, And I'd have women, you know, you minister with moms too. They can't make it every week. So I started writing because they would miss a week and I didn't want them to fall behind. So Mm -hmm. all of it was just little slow steps that the Lord brought me along. Um, and all of them have been a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really thought I was going to spend, and I wanted to minister in the public school system and run a fellowship of Christian athletes and work with high school students. That was my vision. So ministry was always in my vision. I just thought I was going to do it more in a public setting, public school setting, not a specific church or ministry organization. So Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for what I get to do, but it is a shock to me. So what to say to some, someone who wants to do these things, I would say just faithfully do them in the context you are and just see what the Lord will do. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether if you're, if you're at a workplace, maybe you start a Bible study in your workplace at lunch or something like that. So I just feel like the Lord has opened doors um, in really sweet ways. But yeah, the First time we did that Bible say we had five women and four of them were the leaders. Okay. Yeah. So things <laughs> starting small, Yeah, <laughs> I think is really normal. And that was for two years. We did that. And slowly the Lord made it 30 and 35 women in your living room and things like that. But it, it's just amazing how he gives us the training grounds in these small places. I think that then allows us to do it in a larger context, but he's building us through that process. And so I love looking back and saying, wow, he really did this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm thankful. Well, also, I think you took a step out to say, I'm going to invite people to my house. You just mentioned it was <laughs> in your house, which I didn't picture that before, that you invited them to your house. And that takes a really for a lot of people, that is the biggest step is just to say, I see a need and I'm going to be the one to meet it. Do you remember those, that moment when you made that decision kind of went, went through your head? Yes, I can actually remember. I was, I lived in kind of a different side of town than most of my friends. So what I really remember is I was sitting on the playground at the preschool by myself and no one talked to me. You know, all these moms are running around. It felt like everyone had their friends, and I was just kind of sitting there with my two-year-old, and I, and so I'll say this. It actually, the first thing it started with was prayer and loneliness, and so I was sitting there, and I just said, Lord, you've clearly put me in this preschool will you open doors um, so that I can get to know women to, to share with them? And then in God's grace, a couple of my friends did move near me and they entered that preschool. And so all of those things happened. But yeah, it, it, I think it starts with the willing heart to say, Lord, will you use me here? I'm not just at this preschool randomly. It's not what I would choose. I'd really like to be with all my girlfriends at the preschools they're at. Um, so will you take this place and use it. And I almost tear up just right now thinking about what happened in those 13 years of that preschool and what a beloved place it became for so many. And we watched people come to the Lord through it so that he, it was not, I thought it was me just having to kind of deal with not having the money to live in the other part of town, but the Lord had a purpose Mm. even in where my child went to preschool. And so I look back and I say, wow, he knows exactly where we're supposed to be. And I'm Mm -hmm. thankful. That's so great. I love how that intersects so many things I've seen in my own life and I see in others. I was just talking to a young mom just the other day and she said, because I'm new to a place, I just feel like I want other people to feel welcome because I know what I've experienced being new. And I think that's where God calls us often is because we see the need and other people don't see it. They don't feel the same 
conviction about that thing, like what you're saying. And so sometimes just seeing the need is often God calling us to be a part of the solution somehow and just to be faithful to do the next thing, which is what you did. I'd love to talk more about the teaching aspect of that though, because you're, you now have invited women into your, into your home and, and now where you are now, you do a lot of teaching and a lot of equipping of other women who are teaching. I would love to know how you first knew that that was maybe a gift that God was cultivating in you and how did you then cultivate that gift. That's a, that, that's, it's, it's a little bit actually embarrassing when, when I think <laughs> about it, when I look back, I became a Christian, um, really through the fellowship of Christian athletes at my local high school. And I think I started leading a Bible study two years later. I mean, I can't even imagine. I kind of cringe to think through what was I saying in that Bible study? I mean, I'm sure it was full of so many things that were not correct, but I I think it was just the Lord showing me that this is what he wanted me to do. I mean, that, you know, it's almost like I came to Christ and all I could think of is now I need to teach someone else about it. Um, and, and really, so in some sense, it's for all of us because of the great commission. I mean, Mm -hmm. not everyone's going to be a formal teacher up front you know, in front of people, but the great commission is go and teach all that I've commanded, you know, so it's disciple making is just about turning to the person behind you and saying, Hey, here's what I've learned about Jesus. Let me tell you, um, that feels a lot less scary than teaching. <laughs> you know, yes, we say, yes. Oh, I'm just looking at this text with you and saying, Hey, I heard this about this. And, and we're all having a conversation about it. And the Holy spirits our guide. And so from that point, really from 16 on, I can't think of a year I wasn't leading a Bible study in some, in some way. Um, and so the Lord, again, kept bringing opportunities. And, and I would say I was eager to learn. So when I'm looking for women who, who are probably gifted with teaching, I would say they tend to have a really strong desire to learn themselves, um, that they want to understand that they're naturally curious about the text. Maybe that's a way that they don't just read it and say, Hmm, that's interesting. They're like, Oh no, what's a Samaritan? Why does it talk about the Samaritan woman here? Why, why was it at noon that he, you know, they're talking, I mean, they're looking at the details and, and trying to understand the bigger story a lot of the times. And so, when I see women like that in my Bible study, I'm like, oh, they need to be teaching. They're also often, I would say, this might sound bad, the ones who are more critical of poor teaching, um, <laughs> often, you, you know, I, I will say, or feel frustrated if a Bible study isn't getting to the Bible. Maybe that's a way to say it. Like if the yeah. Bible study is just everybody sitting around talking about their day, those are the women who are like, why am I here? This right. is a waste of my time. Well, that's a woman who probably needs to be teaching and she, cause she wants to get people in the text. She doesn't want to just sit around and talk about, you know, the weather or whatever right. she right. wants to dig deeper. And so sometimes it's the ones who might find problems <laughs> in what's going on that I think are the very ones who maybe that's their gifting, mm. um, in, in the church. And so, you know, but, but that's how the way the Lord opened the doors for me was just through, openings that continually arose and just a strong desire to do that with them. It's probably my happy place to be sitting around with a group of women talking about the Bible. And I would say I actually like teaching through facilitating better than I necessarily like giving a 45 minute talk. Mm -hmm. I want to hear what you think about it. And I want, yeah, that helps me really care for my women even better Mm -hmm. to kind of hear them engaging the text Mm -hmm. rather than me just teaching it. So that's kind of my favorite time. I love how you're bringing up different types of teaching because we, we think often of teaching as someone standing at the front of the room, like a pastor does, but teaching can happen in, in discipleship. As you said, it can happen in a facilitating discussion as you described, and it can happen through lecture teaching. Uh, So I would love to know as you pinpoint those women, if you're seeing women in your church in your role as the women's minister, and you think they might have that gift, how are you cultivating that? How are you pulling them out and giving them opportunities to practice and to see if that's something God would have them to do? 
That's a great question. And I love this part of my job. Um, one thing we have are outreach studies. That's kind of the basis. We don't have a big Bible study that meets at our church. We have neighborhood or preschool driven or some way that they're related, maybe an elementary school that they're all in. And we um, just encourage women to look at where the Lord has placed them in their city and say, could you start an outreach Bible study? Is there a friend from the church who lives nearby and you all start it together? And so that um, is really kind of a low key way to begin. It's normally in their home. It's maybe five to 10 women. One of my good friends who has never led a Bible study ever in her life, she put, um, her neighborhood has a Facebook page and she just went on the Facebook page and said, I'm starting a Bible study in my home. You're welcome to come. And she, uh, amazingly, all these women came and then she caught me and she's like, what am I supposed to do with them? <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> so, exactly. And so that was an instance when, where she said, I really don't feel comfortable teaching. And so she actually did a Jen Wilkins study. They did the study and they watched the videos. That was a great intro for her into it. The next semester she led, you know, but that was a helpful way for her to begin and to see, okay. First, let's just get everybody in the room talking about the Bible. The next semester, she led herself um, and has the Bible study has continued to go on. So that's the first step in our church kind of is to lead something like an outreach day. Then we have women's Sunday school. Um, our Sunday schools are done in eight-week rotations. So we have times when women teach women. And what's great about that, that's more like standing up and teaching probably 60 to 70 women. So that's a little bit different. It's a little more... Um, teacher driven, less facilitator model. And then the third step, when I see who's doing that pretty well, you know, and I say, oh, wow, she's really gifted at this, is um, we often on our retreats have women from our own church teach. So I took three of those women who I could see were gifted in teaching, and the three of them each taught a 145 minute session at our women's retreat. So it works out great because here we are sourced in our own community with three women who can do a retreat talk. Mm. That's great. I you love know? that. And so I was kind of, you know, just helping them all along the way and trying to help with outlines and trying to help with how do you do this well? Um, but again, it's the behind encouraging rather than, because if I'm always the one teaching, no one else will ever learn. Okay. So sometimes saying no for us in leadership is one of the most important ways we can develop other women in these roles mm -hmm. um, is saying, no, I'm not going to do it. I, let's let someone else do it and help them do it. That's to me, the way we grow women leaders is always investing back so that we can have those future teachers in our churches. That's so good. I'm also thinking though about churches that don't have any formal women's ministry. They don't have a women's minister on staff. So maybe there's not a point person for anybody who is saying, hey, you should come and do this or let me help you do this. So what would you say to women who are in churches that they may, they feel this kind of com compulsion to teach and to lead other women, but the pastor or maybe there's just no formalized way that she can see of how do I go about doing this? Or maybe there's not much support from leadership. So what would you say to a woman like that? Well, and when we began, that was kind of our situation. There was no woman on staff. Um, and so that's why we started these outreach studies. They actually weren't in our church. And, and this may sound bad, but we didn't even know to ask permission. <laughs> we just did. Um, and I think that's okay because Jesus has given us all authority to go out and make disciples. So I think it's okay. Um, to just start a neighborhood Bible study. And then um, if your church is willing to be involved and support, that's wonderful. But hopefully that's allowable. Because I mean, I think yeah, that's exactly I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because I think sometimes as women, we can be so fearful to do anything. But that's why I always want to encourage women. All authority, Jesus said, has been granted to me. And so I tell you, go and make disciples. And so based on Jesus's words, I think we can just go and start. And that might be two women that we have, and we're just walking through the book of John with. And what a wonderful thing to get to do. I have one friend who has a Muslim friend, and they have been studying the Bible together for five years. 
just going through the text one-on-one. You know, so she is teaching, even though it's not this Bible study of 500 women or whatever, but she is faithfully teaching this friend, the scriptures, and it's wonderful to see. So, uh, you know, I would just pray and ask the Lord, where, where do you have me that I can do this? Mm -hmm. Um, If you feel that, desire. And, and also I always want to say, it's also okay if you don't feel that desire, right. not right. everyone has to be, you know, a formal teacher, but I do think we all teach in some way, even if it's, you're sitting on a park bench with a friend or over lunch, you know, just chatting, we're all giving the word to each other in certain ways, just through our advice that we give, what we're talking about when we, we talk to one another. I think of that Colossians passage, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Of course, that means we're not going to all stand up and teach a big group. But I think it's just a lifestyle of speaking into one another's worlds that we all need um, and builds our own faith in the process as we are sharing with others what we've learned. Mm -hmm. What are some of the obstacles that you have faced just in your own personal ministry as a teacher? Maybe I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking specifically about things that other people might be surprised about. I think as I watch other women step into more of a teaching role in, within our church, they always are surprised sometimes to find, oh, you know, I maybe don't get a lot of feedback or how do I know that I'm doing this in a faithful way? And so what are some of the things for you that you faced? I would say I usually after I sit down, feel like I said nothing of value and why on earth did they have me stand up here and teach? So I didn't realize how insecure I feel. I mean, that's kind of horrible to admit, but I just talked to my own women two weeks ago on our women's retreat and I sat down afterwards and thought all those things, they just rushed to my head of, did you even make any sense? You know, and, and and I will say, so let me put that, let me step back and say, I think that's the spiritual attack. I was unprepared for the fact that our enemy hates truth going out. And so for me, the way the attack comes is often feeling like I'm not good enough. Um, I'm not funny enough. I don't know, you know, whatever it could be. I'm <laughs> right. not entertaining enough. Right. Rather than just letting me be content that the word went out. Yeah. And God will do what he will do with it. And that the goal is that the women see Jesus, not think I did a great job. Or, you know, that they go home thinking about scripture, not the great example I gave. And just, I, I, think, I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing I didn't realize is how much work it would take. The mm. best teachers make it look so easy, like it just flows off their tongue. And it's really helpful living with another teacher because I see how much work my husband puts into. Yes. So it's not just that I'm really, really slow at it. Um, he faces the same thing. He prepares, prepares, and prepares. And when he stands up there, he makes it look so easy. And I you know, kind of want to throw my shoe at him because he makes <laughs> it look so easy. Right. And, um, and, and then I realized, oh, it, what you see in a 45-minute talk took hours to yes. prepare. Yes. hours and uh, hours of study. And you left so much on the cutting room floor that you never even got to talk about um, in those 45 minutes. So I, I think it's both, the, um, I thought I'd be more confident in teaching God's word by now. And I thought it would come a lot quicker than it does. <laughs> yeah. So do you ever get discouraged about teaching? Or just in ministry in general. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes it's just, you know, is that, and I will ask myself this regularly, is this the best use of my time and gifts? You know, is this what I should be doing? Um, And so there's just discouragement that can come too with the the workload that we've all been given. I mean, you know, as, as you have as well, just as a pastor's wife and a writer and all of these balls we're juggling. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes discouragement comes in that you can spend a lot of time in ministry on something and sometimes see no fruit from it. I mean, some of the most painful things are people my husband and I have invested in for years. And then sometimes they just walk away 
yeah, from the faith altogether, walk away from your church and then walk away from the faith altogether. And that's discouraging. You know, you just are thinking, did I not love them well enough? Did, did I do something wrong that caused them to walk away? Now I know that's not true, but it's just where the discouragement can come in. If we had done something better, maybe they wouldn't have walked away or things like that. But I, I think ministry, I think there's a continual battle for discouragement. And I don't even think that that's wrong. I think that's why we hear when God is talking to Joshua, he says, don't fear for I am with you. Be strong and courageous. We still need that message today in ministry. Our giants look different, but they're still there. Um, And I think one of the big ones is discouragement. And that is that not having courage to go forward. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord says, yeah, he doesn't say it'll be easy, but he says, I'm with you. And that's the best news we have is that he's with us in those moments. So how do you talk yourself through those moments of great discouragement? How do you keep going forward? That's another good good question. Um, I think I am getting more quick at realizing the lie of the enemy and fighting the battle of my mind. And I can sit around and choose to think about all that's wrong. Or I can do what Paul told us to do in Philippians. I mean, he is in the midst of jail and he says, whatever is lovely, you know, whatever is praiseworthy, think about these things. And I can be so much stuck in my head thinking of all the negative things. And I'm just reiterating them the way my family is not going how I want it, the way my ministry is not going how I want it, the way my day isn't going how I want it. And then I hear from this man in jail, Think about lovely and praiseworthy and excellent things. And and I realize the battle really is in my mind. And so I'm learning to fight there rather than just try to get my circumstances neat and tidy so I don't have to trust God. Mm. That's my temptation. That's what I would have done 20 years ago. Yeah, or maybe maybe one year ago, who knows, (laughs) just try to get everything worked out. Maybe I need to get a more manageable schedule. Maybe I need to stop doing this or doing that. Whereas first I need to step back and say, what am I thinking about? And ask myself some different questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I trust God with this not going well or being difficult or being uncomfortable? And that really helps me with the discouragement to just hear again the truth that he is with me and he will never leave me and that it's okay to be afraid but just know where I'm clinging in the fear you know and that helps me that's good you mentioned managing your schedule that is something that I struggle with a lot where we are in our life stage with I have two teenagers I have a younger son than that you know, all the things, all the hats that we described earlier that you're wearing. I'm not wearing those same hats, but similar. And I'm coming up against my limits more and more and more. And I don't like that, but I also struggle to make decisions about where I put my time and energy. So I would love to hear from you with all the hats that you're wearing and opportunities to serve. How do you know when to say yes and when to say no? Because the no's are often to good things. Right. So how do you do that? Yes. Yes. That is getting harder and harder. I think probably for both of us in our worlds, mm-hmm. like these are great opportunities that sometimes we're having to say no to. Um, one thing that has been really helpful for me, we actually do a training at our church for leaders on trying to discover what you're uniquely gifted at. Meaning what do you bring to the table that no one else brings to the table? And it doesn't mean that you don't serve in other areas. That's not a like get out of jail card because changing diapers in the nursery isn't your unique (laughs) gift. That's not the intent at all. Um, it, It is more, and I think this becomes increasingly important as we age. Um, because we are getting more and more uniquely gifted in certain things. Um, and I think the younger I was, I was still trying to figure out what those were. Yeah. And so now I really try to say, am I one of the only people who could do this? Okay. Maybe I really need to consider it. But if it's something like teaching on a retreat, are there other women who could do that? Yeah, there are other women who could do that. Um, for you and me both, I am uniquely gifted as my child's mother. I'm the only one they get. Right. <laughs> so sometimes that's going to require things of me. I'm 
my husband, I hope I'm his only wife. So that's a unique <laughs> gift. Well, I hope so too. Only, only I, I know, that would be bad. You know, there are certain things that we know we're called to. Maybe that's a good way to put it, that we know I'm the only person in the whole universe that can be his wife and can be my, my children's mom. Um, and so then the other is questioning, what is really in my calling that the Lord wants to, to use for his kingdom? Um, I often ask myself, am I doing this out of guilt or fear? I am very prone. I, I'm, a, I'm a woman who hates to say no. So I am often doing out of, out of just a fear of disappointing someone. You know, I don't want to let people down. And I've had to just get tougher and say, you know, I can't. Me saying yes to this is always me saying no to something else. Mm -hmm. And so really trying to figure out, is this really worth saying yes to? And that does, like you said, mean saying no to some really good opportunities. Um, There was one book series that someone wanted me to edit. And I I had that fear. I don't know if you ever have this of, well, maybe no one else will ever ask me to write another book again. So (laughs) should I do this? (laughs) You know? And that's a great thing someone's asking you to do, but I ended up saying no to it because I actually didn't feel uniquely gifted to do the series they wanted. And I I didn't feel like I, I, I knew therefore, because it wasn't in my center spot that it would take a lot more work for me to do it. And, you know, they found someone to do it who's great at it. Mm. And that's exactly what she should be doing. Um, and so I think sometimes we do let go of good opportunities, but they might not be good for us. And I think that series, for instance, is better because she's the one doing it than it would be if I had done it. Um, but it's, it's a fearful thing to say no mm-hmm. um, at, at some points. But those are the things that I try to think through. The, uh, the last one is, is this a good thing that would be better at another time or another season in my life? So sometimes I'm saying no to certain things because right now, for instance, for me speaking outside and traveling now is not the best season for that most of the time because my kids are actually home on the weekend. It was actually easier for me when my kids were younger because I was with them all day. So it was kind of like, yep, I can be gone on the weekend. (laughs) That's okay. Now they're in school all day. So me being gone on the weekend is actually harder. So I say no to that more just in this season, but in another season, I hope I can say yes to a lot more. Yeah. It takes for me trust that God is going to give me the opportunity in the time that I can actually do it. I want to do all the things at the same time. And right now I'm not patient and I'm not trusting that God's going to give me the opportunity later on when I do have more, more time to do it. So that's really good. I find it so hard. I find this to be one of the hardest things. Yes. Yes. We're learning, right? (laughs) Uh, I want to go kind of go back a little bit when we were talking about women in the church and you and I have been a part of some conversations recently about women and just in the evangelical world and their role in the church. And I would love to know just for you to get to speak to if there are any pastors listening. I know my husband at least will listen, so he can speak to him. Um, <laughs> but what would you say to men about men in leadership roles, about women using the gift of teaching and leadership? I would say do whatever you can um, to encourage them in it. And all that takes is sometimes just noticing it's not like you have to do a full program to how are we going to support women in the church? I I can just think back to small ways. Um, Men gave encouragement to me along the way and it was really simple, but it made a huge impact on me. In fact, I was at a gathering probably about six months ago and a pastor whom I respect immensely came up to me And he said, hey, I really appreciate what you write on the Gospel Coalition. Please keep writing. That meant the world to me. It took five seconds for him to do that. You know, it was so um, small of a gesture, but it really encouraged me for months of writing. And so I think... um, Women often just feel so encouraged by you saying there's a place for you here. And so when, you know, a pastor simply says something like, hey, tell me how the women's retreat went. How, how was your time teaching? 
just showing general interest really means a lot to women. And what it communicates is, I think your ministry in the church is really valuable. It's not lesser because it's to women. It's not a you know siloed over there that the men never know what's happening in women's ministry. Um, but it's really valuable. It's really important. And I want to hear what's going on with it. I think just showing that kind of respect and concern can be really helpful that a pastor can do and really help the, the ministry of women flourish. And I always think about, it was Paul writing to Timothy, or sorry, it was actually Paul writing to Titus um, to say, have the older women teach the younger women. It was two men talking about women's ministry. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that pastors are having the conversation, make sure this is happening in your churches. So I, I do, you know, want them to be thinking through how can we help spur that on? Because Paul was doing it back in the first century. So hopefully we're going to keep that trend up and that pastors are going to talk about how are we making sure this is happening? Because our churches will be so much stronger if we have older women teaching younger women and we need it desperately in our churches. Absolutely. Cause I, I think my fear is the younger women are going to leave and go find that elsewhere, or they're going to use that gift elsewhere outside of the church because there are opportunities for them. But I really, my, I'm just super passionate about this of wanting to see women in within the church, the local church being supported, encouraged by their pastors and leaders to cultivate their gifts and to use them. Okay. So final question, what, are the joys for you in serving? Oh, um, I sometimes have to just step back and say, what an amazing privilege to get to do what we do. You know, I get to one, be a Christian. I mean, sometimes I think <laughs> right. we lose sight of like the Lord chased me down redeemed me for himself, called me to himself, saved my soul, sent his son to rescue me. I mean, that's amazing. And then he calls us into building his church mm -hmm. and he invites us into that. And he says, you get to come and labor for something that matters. I mean, think about that. Everyone who does not know Christ is continually laboring for something that will not last. Mm -hmm. It is like, a, you know, building a sandcastle at the sea. It is beautiful for a day, but it will be washed away. And you and I, we get to build for eternity. I mean, what we are doing is going to last. Um, what, a, what a great thing. I mean, that does, it fills me with joy to say, okay, this is hard. Uh, yeah. I mean, the Christian life in scripture is described as a race, a battle and childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say that wow. alone helps me because sometimes I'm like, yeah, this doesn't feel as joyful as I think it should. But when I remember how it's described, but all of those activities are incredibly hopeful. You know, you run a race, you hope that you're going to win the prize when you're in a battle, you're hoping for peace on the other end. And when you're in childbirth, you're definitely hopeful. This baby right, will right. finally come out. <laughs> so there's the hope of the joy that will come that propels us in our race and in our bath, battle and in childbirth. And so I think today may feel really hard for a lot of us in the ministry world, but there's the hope. Our rest is coming. And our savior is coming and we're going to go to a place where we're going to be celebrating all of what he did in us and through us and in his church for all of eternity. And we're going to be singing those songs of just wonder and amazement. And that hope I actually think gives us present joy today mm -hmm. um, that as we look forward to what will be, we can rest assured that what we do today matters, that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And, you know, I think that's the greatest hope we can have because I think what really weighs people down is they feel like they work and they work and they work. And what have I done? They're in Ecclesiastes, you know, that all, all everything's vanity, vanity, vanity. And we actually get to live lives that aren't that way. So that brings me joy when I look, when I look at, step back and look at the full picture. That is beautiful. That encourages me today, Melissa. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate so much your time and your ministry. We haven't talked specifically about your books. So 
the latest one is there's a new one coming out, I think, right? For kids. Yes. Yes. Praying for children. Yes. So it's, it's, it's not a, for it's kids. Five thing, yes. Yes. It's a five things to pray for your children. So um, that one's just really going through scripture and praying for your kids. It's, it's just to help parents. Yeah. And it's excellent. I actually got to see it and it's an excellent resource. It's really just go straight to here's some things that you can pray for your children, gives you the verses. I loved it. I think it's going to be a great resource. But then also I just recently did your Philippians Bible study called in all things, right? Yes, that's it. That's it. And it's a lot about joy. A lot about the things that you were just talking about made me think of Paul saying to live as Christ, to die as gain. Like, I'm going to stay here and be with you. It's better for you. I'm going to serve you. So that reminds me of your Bible study. And that's a really great resource as well. You have a lot. So we'll link, I'll link to it in the show notes, all your different uh, Bible studies and books that you've written. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This is so fun to get to chat. Friends, don't forget to grab a copy of Melissa's latest book, Five Things to Pray for Your Kids. I also really love her latest Bible study on the book of Philippians called In All Things. Join me next week as I chat with Darina Williamson. Darina calls herself a bridge builder, and I can't wait for you to hear about how she's doing exactly that in her hometown of Nashville. Until then, friends, have a great week and keep walking forward by faith.